Now you're welcome, Max. So I think it's fair to say it's been an interesting 15 months when it comes to the Republic of Ireland team. A man very much at the centre of all that joins us in studio now. Very happy to say Keith Andrews, Ireland assistant coach, is here. It's great to have you in. Thanks for coming in. No worries, Joe. Pleasure. I was just saying to you there a moment ago that you're usually, or you were for a time in here, dishing out the criticism. So. <laughs> I know, it goes around, comes around. It's good it? to see you get some over the last 15 yeah. months. Look, you've got to have a thick skin, haven't you? <laughs> so loads to talk about. The point of this chat really is, I suppose, to reflect on the last 15 months, to look ahead to the October internationals, Azerbaijan on the 9th of October, Qatar, and then in November it's Portugal and Luxembourg. Um, so much as anything, because we haven't seen you much publicly. You have kept a low profile. That's your decision, is it? Or yeah, you, like, your thinking? I, th- I think so. Um, I've been quite conscious of being front and centre of things. Obviously, I had a, a presence, like you've alluded to, in here and on our platforms at, at certain stages since retirement, which which I enjoyed, really enjoyed, but I felt it was important once I took this role in particular to a, to a point with the 21s, but certainly with this role with Stephen, with the senior team, I, it was important that I did take a little bit of a back seat. I still do bits and bobs in England, as you know, with Sky. And, mm. I enjoy going over, being at games first and foremost, and then that gives me the chance as well to go and watch our players, which which we do a lot as well. So yeah, I, I think it was it, it was certainly a conscious decision that I made at the time. Yeah, because I mean, previous regimes, I suppose the Roy Keane, Martin O'Neill one jumps to mind. Mm. Tuesday or Wednesday press conference, he was out, and then later in the week it was O'Neill. You decided not to go in for that. Yeah, look, St- look, Stephen's been very Stephen's very good with me, full stop, and. We're very much a team and how we work together on everything um, and on aspects like aspects like that he would have been open to to me doing some but now he's he hasn't pushed it and equally I haven't really been wanting to either has this uh, lived up to what you hoped it would be when it comes to coaching I'm sure you had you know thoughts of getting into coaching versus media mm. how have you enjoyed it it's been tough like there's no getting away from that um the timing of it I think if you if you roll it all into one, 21 senior, I've loved it. I have absolutely loved it. I think you know the passion I have for the Irish team, full stop, player, fan, now coach. I think when you when you look at what we've had to go through in the world over the last 18 months, it's just been very, very difficult to to navigate your way through that at certain stages because of COVID and because of the impact that it had on us. Going back 12 months ago that autumn of last year was was so difficult it's been different this year I think it's been more enjoyable and that's played a huge part in it just how we deal with each other and it hasn't been as strict if you like or hasn't been as prevalent certainly in our camps and hopefully that continues um, and I think you know as well since since retirement I've always wanted to be proactive I've always wanted to stay in the game I love football I've always done both um, for the last few years of playing and then when I retired I've, I've done media I've also coached the underage teams and I've got a real passion for it and, and desire for us to, to do well so it's had its tests obviously and it hasn't been plain sailing clearly um, and obviously most people only know certain parts of it um, and I think it's important that and we touch on certain parts and how difficult it has been at times as well as has obviously been enjoyable for for large parts. Yeah, well, I don't think I'm breaching confidence to say you reached out and said, look, I haven't done much. I might come in for a chat. Feel free to, you know, throw the criticism at me and it's a chance for me to respond. How much of the criticism are you aware of? What would you say, I'm interested to know, what would you say is the biggest criticism of management or the team over the last year? Yeah, I, I have to be completely honest. In camp, I read nothing, absolutely nothing. I've told friends and family to not send me things. I don't want to. I want to be tunnel visions when it comes to our games. Post game, you know, all I get back to is messages from friends and family. I don't touch on any mm-hmm. news source, and I think that's important. Post camp, I have to be honest, I don't tend to get into too much. But you obviously hear little mm-hmm. bits and bobs back, like when I'm going to me butchers and they're, they're nailing us for for not scoring too many goals at the time. So it's look, that's that's part and parcel of it. Are they really in the butchers? Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, they're they're hilarious. Yeah, they, they tell us what team to pick, who should be playing, who should be playing. So there's that kind of yeah, very very transparent with their thoughts. So that started going back even when I was there, like not in football, just having chats. And such a section would take me twenty minutes. Yeah. And but you, but it's impossible to keep the world totally out. So you'd have a sense of of what is being said. So what do you think the big criticism is? Well, obviously results. Mm. Obviously results. You're in a results business. 
and you need to get results and that's something obviously we're fully aware of and I think if some of those games where the results have swung in our favour where they've slightly gone the other way then I think in the main a lot of people would be be content or certainly the ones that have have been critical of of the regime or what we've what we've tried to to put in place so I would say that's probably the big biggest criticism but you will have heard a lot more yeah. than I would have, obviously. It was very interesting. Stephen Kenny came out recently and said this is very much about the Euros in 2024. Is that your understanding? Like, did you two sit down and map it out that way? Is that how you viewed the World Cup qualification? Is that how you viewed your time together? No, would be the answer. Um, in short, to, to elaborate on that, I think where Stephen's coming from with that will be, and this is my opinion, it, it's not a short-term view. I think the short-term view to this crossroads where we've come to in Irish football, and it is a crossroads and it has been a crossroads with what's gone on in that building in recent years, which we've, we've talked about, everybody's talked about, and rightly so. We're on the road to recovery in the background, and I think in terms of the actual pitch, the football side, the players, the organisation all around that, I think if you took a really short-term view, it would only get you so far I've said this before and probably more privately amongst us and fr again, again amongst fr friends and family, I felt there had to be a little bit of short-term pain to get where we needed to go. So when you look at some of these players that have come in to the squad over the last 12 months or so, it hasn't been plain sailing for some of them. Some of them have had very good performances followed by not so good performances. But I think when you look at the whole... I think what Stephen's getting at is this group was always going to be very difficult, no doubt. Does that mean we went into this campaign thinking we're going to be comfortable, sat, toured, fourth, fifth? Obviously not. Yeah. But I think there's a bigger picture view and I think he needs credit for that because he does look long term. He does look at Irish football and, and I pointed out World Cup 92, which was 88 and 90 were what made me fall in love with football. He is a visionary. He is a romantic when it comes to Irish football and where he thinks it should be perceived. And I'm very much aligned with that. Are the results worse than you thought they'd be when you say you anticipated short-term pain? Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah there's, no, there's no two ways of getting away from that. I think you've, you've got to look at it in different ways. I certainly do. Not, not everybody has to. That's, that's probably wrong. I look at it in terms of performances. And in terms of performances... You look back at the game, obviously, with your own eyes and the different camera angles that we have and our analysis department, we all look at it back, we all get together, coaching staff, technical staff, and see, obviously, where it went wrong. Did we give the right information? Was the game plan right? Was the strategy right? The information to the players, the opposition? Did we get our analysis right on them in terms of how to break them down? We've also introduced uh, a data company, and it's all performance related, a German company that PSG use, top European teams use, all around your KPIs, around how you win games. And there's a direct correlation between these KPIs, what you hit in game, and the results. And in certain results, we should have won. That haven't gone our way. Performance wise, when you look at the data, when we look at our eyes back and see the game, we feel, backed up with data, that we should have won certain games. Now, that obviously hasn't happened, and that's they're the tough ones to take. And equally, certain games, there's periods of games, Azerbaijan, Luxembourg, where there's periods of those games that we're far from happy with the level of performances. Mm. What's happening in those periods? Opposition, obviously, throw spanners in the works. If you look at the most recent one where there's a little bit of frustration would be, for me, 10, 12, 15 minutes into the first half against Azerbaijan. Started the game very, very well front foot, asking serious questions. We're big on penetration in terms of getting beyond teams, getting into areas where we feel we can we can hurt the opposition and certainly with the personnel available to us, I think that's that's a way that we have looked to go. Um, our out of possession shape and our strategy around how we win the ball back was was lopsided, wasn't as efficient as it should and, and could have been. That's an interesting one you bring up, say, for instance, the Azerbaijan game. So you have the three uh, younger lads mm. up top there in Parrot, Conley and Ida, and it was very interesting even watching on the television. So example, first you know, 15, 20 minutes, like you say, keeper has the ball, the three lads aren't pressing the keeper, you kind of think, okay, fair enough. Maybe you might like to see it at home, get the crowd going. 
but certainly first pass to centre half who's pulled wide no real pressure on him either and play develops and Stephen Kelly was on commentary and he said well that must be from Stephen Kenny that is Stephen Kenny because the players wouldn't not press there unless they were told and then watching the Serbia game the pressure on the ball keeper and certainly if not keeper first pass was definitely a trigger so were there different messages for both games or in the Azerbaijan game did players maybe just drop the ball a bit or maybe you didn't communicate well enough to players or some, something went wrong there? Yeah, I th- for, first off, there is different intricacies going into each game. It's not set in stone. How we found, even with a really short lead up to a game, players are really good at taking information on board. Okay. I think that's the era we live in now. So a lot of that isn't on the grass. When you look at Portugal in terms of what we actually had in terms of preparation time, some players played on a Sunday and then we, we go again on a Wednesday. So they're not actually going to kick too many footballs between that and the game. Mm. But the information that they take on board, we try and give them about the strategy, both in and out of possession, a game plan, a model, whatever way you want to call it. They've been brilliant at taking it on board. And there is differences game to game. And that's something I think as a staff we're very conscious of. We want to try and have a consistency. I think you've seen that in the, the system we've played in the last three camps. And then within that, in and out of possession, how much can we as a staff throw at the the players for them to take on board and not bombard them with different messages because they're all coming from different clubs and styles and you have to bring that together. So for those games, Mm. there was differences in how we approached it from goal kicks, set restarts. They will look like that. Can we again go and approach it like this? Mm. And in game to game, there is differences. You've touched on the three front lads 19, 20, 21 years of age there's elements of that and this wasn't just their fault by the way there was elements in terms of how we pressed as a team that we didn't react to quick enough so for me there's a plan can you go and win the back but there's also a plan of you don't get played through Mm -hmm. too easily and I felt for 25, 30 minutes in the first half we allowed them to play through us too easily and Mahmoudov their talisman number 8 was very prevalent in, in that period of the mm. game which we'd alluded to before the game and look technically they're, they're a good team when you give them time and space to play So is that a good uh, kick up the ass for everyone at half time kind of a game then? I think so I think y- you've, you have to say you have to go about it in certain ways and you have to get the message across of there's the, the tactical approach here that we, we set up and we all agreed to and we all buy into and the players are brilliant at buying into it mm-hmm. training ground meetings everything around it but then there's also a, a reaction on the pitch to what's actually happening and how we need to try and stop that on the pitch I think when it gets to half time it's here's how we tweak it yeah. but the next level is you've, you've got to find ways of stopping them you've got to think outside the box on the pitch as well in terms of this isn't right this doesn't feel right as a team and then your leaders, your vocal players on the pitch obviously come to the fore. And that's where lack of experience comes in a touch as well. Um, on the point you sort of made initially, say it's about results, it's hard, there's so much talk about the team at the moment. I, I don't remember it being as divisive before. There's almost, uh, you know, there's a real like split when it comes to this. But it's hard to try and knit what all the criticisms are together into one kind of perfect line to you but I suppose you you hit on it when you said ultimately it's about results and you would have played under Trapattoni and so you would understand the value of pragmatism and being organised and being tough to beat and you reach a Euros and could have reached a World Cup if if you were to try and deduce what other former internationals may be looking on or saying or, or critics publicly are saying it would be have we lost sight of just getting results too much you know all for playing youngsters and look into 2024 but actually have we gone too far away from let's primarily be tough to beat and so one area where that's kind of a concern is the goals that are being conceded I mean they're so soft they must be driving you and Stephen Kenny Mm. berserk at times so talk to us about even whatever it's scoring goals and you know we all know we don't have a Robbie Keane and people keep saying that over and over again what about at the back and the goals that we're conceding yeah I I think and this is me being entirely honest I think our our out of possession shape, if you like, has a real structure. People may perceive a back five to be defensive. I don't fall into that category. I never have in terms of systems make you make of them what you want. You position players in that system where you mm. where you need them to go and be. I think you know certain goals 
Luxembourg freak goal he should never have scored that goal when you look back at it I've looked back at it probably 20, 30 times there's no way he should score that goal from where he is there's no way the Azerbaijan goal should be scored He's 25, 27 yards from goal. We have we have pressure on the ball. Should have got more pressure. We don't, on it. We, we don't have pressure on the ball. We should have had more pressure. On yeah, it. that's actually an example for me of a soft goal. He actually just ran out of ideas because no one was pressing him and felt well. I might as well shoot if I think it was Coleman and Cullen. If they're not going to press me, I'll just keep going and I'll shoot. Soft goals for me are when you are defensively all over the place. You're stretched. Okay. So how would there's how, gaps in your defence where you're constantly getting undone? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Portugal away. Some of the most outstanding players in world football couldn't really break us down until mm. the 89th minute like that that's that's a collective approach to stopping the opposition and I suppose if you flick it in terms of a mentality for us and the message at a half time against Portugal would be and, and this goes back to maybe that long ago World Cup 90 certainly my teams at times if we've got our noses in front we've taken it a step backwards. Mm-hmm. Now, in the second half against Porto, we, everybody was anticipating a reaction and then to push us back, but we still had to probe forward. We still had to find ways of causing problems for them. When you flick it to the Azerbaijan game, could we have got more pressure on the ball? We absolutely could have. Both Seamus and Josh could have got more pressure on, on the ball. And if that had been Bruno Fernandes maybe cocking his leg, would we have? Yeah, potentially. So there's a bit of a mentality one there as well in terms of the alertness when you play against the top players in the world it's there mm. you just have to be on it or you know there's only going to be one outcome and we certainly and I, and I include the players in this we don't underestimate Luxembourg's and Azerbaijan's because we're not good enough to, to underestimate anybody that's the harsh reality of it we have got a brilliant group that we love working with all the time and we never sense that underestimation on their part or our cockiness going from Portugal into Azerbaijan and likewise from Serbia decent performance away even though we lost the game into Luxembourg there wasn't a sense a sniff of that whatsoever Mm. but in terms of defensively I'm quite happy with a lot of aspects of what the lads are producing camp to camp which is difficult because triple head I win those time pressures in terms of how you prep for it but in terms of those goals obviously we're not we're we're far from amateur no that's fair enough so um, the other, uh, one of the other areas which is often discussed is the way we're now playing out from the back. And in some people's eyes, this is the way forward and they're thrilled to see it and they're willing to live with the mistakes. For others, this is overplaying and you're asking players who aren't good enough under pressure to play out. And I could list off examples where it's backfired. Give us your take. Yeah, for me, it's very simple. Um, our players are good enough to play from the back. And then there's, again the information given to the players in terms of if we have the luxury of doing it on the pitch, we will do it, we'll work on it, we break off into unit work, we do that quite a lot in terms of those back three, back five, goalkeeper or whatever the two midfielders linking it. The pictures are there based on what we've seen from the opposition in terms of how they'll press and we always try and give them an out ball and then it comes down to that individual player to make that decision. We we don't want players overplaying. Some people will perceive it and it's, it's obviously subjective. Some, play, some players occasionally make wrong decisions. That happens within football. If we want to go to one-dimensional football and just play long, it's not for me. I wouldn't buy into it. I think the players are better than that. I know the players are better than that. We see it week in, week out with their clubs. When you look at the goalkeepers that we have, how good they are with their feet mm-hmm. and how much they can dictate play and give assurance and belief to those players, there's always pictures for them. There should always be pictures for them. And at times, if that player on the ball hasn't got the picture, it's not his fault. Mm. It isn't his fault. There's also an element of the play short to lure the opposition in. And again, going back to the goalkeepers in particular, the type of delivery they have to play it into from players. Which, to be fair, I would say we saw that against Serbia in particular. Mm. Like, really well, lure them in. And Bizunu, I mean, he's just a revelation. I think everyone smiles when they bring him up. I mean, his delivery is is class. You could see that working really well. Ping balls to the wing-backs, and it worked great. I would think, I mean, I could give you individual examples here that I jotted down from the campaign, be it the penalty conceded against Portugal. Is that for you an example of overplaying there where they were really pressed up? I I think when we look back at it, there's a few components that didn't quite add up and then it comes back to the decision making that if if the bounce ball is in... I th- so the one, that, the one that I think is perceived as risky is, say, for instance, our centre-half is on the ball and he's got a bounce ball in to a centre midfielder, even though there's a, a Portuguese player up his backside. Mm. 
can you bounce it in safe side of the player to take the opposition player out of the equation and it's a simple bounce ball out to either do their centre half or the wing back yeah sometimes we'll push wing backs on to allow that little bit of space for our, our centre halves on either side that's not risky football for me mm. that's players passing the ball 15 20 yards into an area to be able to pass out again we see them do it all the times for our clubs so there is no risk with that for me as long as there is an assurance to how we play and again the players are more than capable of, of doing it mm. that's it it results in a penalty against Portugal mm. against Serbia I'm, I'm working off the more recent games because they're probably fresh in people's uh, memories there was one where again it's what can you do but it's a ball back to Duffy and it slips under his foot and Serbia are in for a chance your point is obviously they're worth it we're sticking with that and we're going to have to live with some of those moments I, th- I, th- I think you know like new managers come into jobs and I'm thinking when I've seen new managers comes in comes into Premier League clubs or whatever level it is and, and you look at what they try and change and then, and then for me it's always are the players capable of playing in, in this way and what is the benefit of playing in this way mm. our players are absolutely capable of it I don't I genuinely don't feel like it's a we're looking for total football here. I, I don't think it's at that level. I think it's a realistic level of what the players can achieve collectively. If teams want to come and press us aggressively, can we play around them? If we don't feel it's right, again, the information is there. Is where's our out ball? Is it going to be Matt Doherty on this occasion? A little clip to a wing back? Is it going to be into our centre forward's feet? There's always that. If this isn't on, if this doesn't feel right for you, secure for you, we know where it's going. Okay. And then we can go and play off that. Is Bazunu a bit of a game changer in terms of his delivery? Those clip balls you're I talking about? I think he's about. phenomenal. I think the goalkeeping department is absolutely phenomenal. I genuinely believe that. I, th- I think when you think about who we've got, who would have been in the squad, the three players named in the last squad were obviously Gavin, Quivin, and Mark Travers. And unfortunately, Mark missed out. Mark's playing in a team that's top of the championship, playing brilliantly. Quivin is behind just behind one of the best goalkeepers in the world and Gavin has gone and proper earned his stripes last year tough times at Rochdale gone to a a bigger club more expectations in Portsmouth playing very very well so the goalkeeping department is in a brilliant place and I think when you look at Gavin's performance in particular against Serbia but even against Portugal to to save that penalty and and it's just his demeanour. Mm. I think what he's got as well, he's got really and a lot of the young players have this, which I really like. Obviously, they've got old school values. They really have old school values, and they've got that sense of when we look at some of the senior players and the the talismanic type of senior players we've had, Seamus and Hab, Seamus, Shane Duffy, James McLean, that they eat it, they live it, they breathe playing for Ireland. These younger players, some of these younger players have it. And Gavin's certainly one of those. I think he's an extraordinary talent. I really mm. do. And, and I think he's an extraordinary human being. He's such a humble young man. And we've seen his dad at the, the hotel video and I'm getting on the bus going to the Serbia game. It's so nice to see that. And you, you need to remember, he's 19 years of age. Like, phenomenal mm. what he's achieved in these last few months. I'll come back to the overplaying in a moment, but just to develop the Bazuna thing there, you mentioned his father. So I presume with COVID, things like bringing families in to meet them and creating a family atmosphere, is that all no-go? Yeah, basically. And it's really sad, isn't it? Because that they were the nice parts. I remember when I played and family could come to the hotel the day after a game when you have those few hours, just a bit of downtime and come and have a cup of tea and a scone or, or, or whatever. And it, it's also kind of interrupted... The, how quick we would have liked the cohesion as a group because when you go back to last year it was that prevalent you know we've heard all weekend and you will have heard it right a cup the team room the team room we've we've got a team room a working room that was put in place the 21s and we wanted to introduce it with the senior team because before that treatment tables masseurs they were all in in individual bedrooms we wanted it all encompassing we wanted to create an environment where players would, would interact not just at meal times or going for coffee here and there so it's a big team room all the medical department are in there there's table tennis there's a pool table there's bean bags there's playstations where the players come and basically just hang out mm. and have that togetherness but obviously <laughs> during the peak of covid even when it comes down to meetings 15 minutes 
two metres apart. It's hard to to build that. So it, look, it ha- it has been difficult. But again, for the for the families as well, some of these young players, ha- that the kids have played eight, nine, ten caps for Ireland. They haven't seen them play. Like it's it's really really sad, really sad. So to get them into the stadium and to see them in and around the hotel as we were leaving was obviously really nice. Yeah, it definitely felt like a happier place the most recent camp, I have to say, the stress of it. But on the um, overplaying point, because I, I suppose for you and for Stephen, a low point is Luxembourg. Mm. My abiding memory, and it's great to have you in and to tease this stuff out as opposed to two-minute interview here and five-minute kind of flash interview. My abiding memory of that game, aside from the result, is Ireland repeatedly, repeatedly trying to play out in the left-hand side of our pitch and getting nowhere very fast. And uh, I look back at the stats. So Bazunu gave the ball 11 times to Kieran Clark, four times to Darrell Shea, handful of times to the rest, and, and basically never went long. And if you look at who those players all passed to, I think Enda Stevens, he either passed to Kieran Clark or to Josh Cullen. Most of Cullen's passes went back to Clark. You get the point I'm making. Yeah. It was like a triangle of doom here. And Luxembourg sensed it early. We didn't beat the press. We kept trying. Fair enough, you've got to keep trying. They sensed it even more. They kept coming, they kept coming. I got the impression Luxembourg were looking around at each other saying, this is great. We know what's coming every time. Let's press the holy hell out of these. And it really sucked a lot of life out of Ireland's performance. And I was thinking, if I'm seeing this, Keith Andrews and Stephen Kenny are seeing this. So so what's going on? And and so talk to us about that because that's part of the overplaying conversation yeah, fr- a bit. Frustrating and, and not adapting maybe to what we should have and could have done. So we spoke a little bit there about maybe Serbia, if you're luring players onto you, there's, there's a reason for that. Can it be sharp enough at times to play in, to go around them, to go through them? If not, then we we bypass it. I spoke before about one of the big KPIs around our performance levels is bypassing opponents, getting past under control, not just lumping it downfield and hoping for the best as a purpose to how we go about things they set up to show at that side there's no, there's no doubt about it if you press press pause on the game you'll see it, it was lopsided mm. they wanted us to go to that side how we could we get around that go back out use your goalkeeper to go the opposite side as they come across one side of the pitch or as you've alluded to maybe as they're coming out and they're on Josh Cullen or they're on Enda Stevens, then it's a simple clip from Kieran Clark into our front players the knock on effect of that for me not always the player on the ball I think the options and the angles ahead of the ball should have been better for my front players. Could have got across, could have made better different angles mm. and clipped in. But we didn't adapt well enough within the game. There's no doubt about that. We didn't react. Why is it so hard to get that message onto the pitch? Um, like the heat of the battle. It, you know, it, Opposition throw spanners in the world. That, a Luxembourg manager has been in place for a long, long time. They've got a really good unity about how they how they go about things. They're spiky opposition. We've seen that against numerous teams in this group. It's not it's not always easy, even without fans. Now fans are back in. It's it's practically impossible. That was the one luxury, I suppose, in terms of getting little tidbits of information. But to to totally go away from that in terms of they've done their due diligence on us in terms of stopping something or setting something up to try and press that was their pressing trigger you asked what ours were against Azerbaijan that was certainly theirs allow it to go to the left hand side try and trap us in there and then we didn't react well enough mm. and, and we know that and we've spoke about obviously at half time we spoke about a post game in terms of what we, we could have and should have done a little bit better on that occasion You mentioned there um, at the very start of the interview and you know cert- certain performance indicators, certain maybe the game plan, we didn't pick the right game plan, or maybe, you know, there's a breakdown in communication when certain things go wrong. What game of them all do you feel, oh, we went with the wrong game plan or the wrong formation, or we, we really, in yeah, hindsight, got like, that wrong? I've, rightly or wrongly, I've probably split a line between last year, September, October, November, was just so difficult. Yeah. It was so, if I go back to just briefly the start of that and talk a little bit about penetration and how we play, how we want to play. Yeah. I think first things first, you have to, and Stephen's big on this, you have to establish control. We have to get to a stage where our players are comfortable having the ball, dictating the play, being the ones that are probing, being the ones that are proactive within the game, maybe taking more of a, a, a responsibility on, in possession. And I think it's probably fair to say within certain games at the start, we were keeping the ball too much without looking for that penetrative pass and penetrative run. So that was the evolution in the early days. So 
the early ones, even though there was decent performances yeah. in the main, I think certain aspects of those games will be quite frustrating. In terms of performances and in terms of maybe personnel, I think it's always, again, easy in hindsight. We just spoke about Porrick, obviously, the weekend. and Harrington, yeah. Yeah, and in terms of selections, and it's always easy. After the game, should have gone with him, mm. should have maybe brought him on at this stage instead. It, it's a constant challenge, and it's a constant one where we will at times beat ourselves up over so what, we've so maybe what, looked what, at that. What's the one? Because I know a game had to pop into your head there. What's the one you would be more likely to beat yourselves up over? I think the Luxembourg game is, is the one that's tough to take in terms of the result and in terms of certainly the first half performance in terms of the way we allowed them to, to dictate where we were going even though we, we dominated possession within the game. I still feel, again, we shouldn't have lost the game. It's mm. just one of those where when we go back last year when we played Wales and we speak about this a lot actually even within the group when we played Wales in the Nations League and we played Finland as well mm. we watched a lot of their games as you do in the build up to the game and I spoke about falling one side of the result one side or the other in a lot of both of their respective games they just fall on the right side of the result they have that knack they had that knack at that stage of being able to find ways of just coming out. And I still think we're getting to that stage. We're getting very, very close. If you look at the Portuguese game, we found a way of getting the, the equaliser against Serbia, which was brilliant for the group. And again, showing that collective resilience to be able to keep going and try and forge away. But look, in terms of one, obviously, when you look at the, the Luxembourg one, it, it would probably be that one. Hmm. I wanted to get your um, take on, on how much... Um chopping and changing has been with the team because it's quite notable like I was so in advance of talking to you I went through all however many games how many is it now you're up to 15 maybe 16 isn't it? 16 games yeah a huge amount of changes all the time so for instance take the most recent camp because that's fresh in people's memories and it's Portugal and so it's O'Shea Duffy Egan it's uh, Coleman on the right Darty on the left and it seems to work very well and you put on Obama Delhi, which is brave move in fairness <laughs> 36 minutes um, and so you couldn't fold that but say for instance you, let's do it through a certain player so say Josh Cullen for instance mm. in your midfield so against Portugal he'll have Matt Doherty as his left wing back he'll be in there with Hendrick and Jamie McGrath who was very good mm. then you go to the Azerbaijan game and McLean goes to wing back so suddenly Doherty's not there and he's in with Malumbi and he's got the three young lads up front so if you're Josh Cullen again things have changed quite a lot and then you go to Serbia, and so McLean is in again, but it's Hendrik to his left, so it's Hendrik who's more working with McLean. And again, he's got a different picture in front of him. It didn't strike me, and this is the question, because I'm thinking of you and Trabtoni, and you knew it was Glenn Whelan, you knew it was behind you, you knew it was in front of you, but it did allow, maybe there was a staleness towards the end, but it did allow relationships on the pitch to grow and little understandings and moments of, oh, I know, Glenn, I know Glenn's going to do that. I, and I'll do that. I think that's really important. So I, I just look at a lot of these team selections, you take, uh, excuse me, you take Josh Cullen as an example. I feel like we're throwing out a lot of teams where if I'm Josh Cullen, using him as the conduit, oh, it's different every time. Mm -hmm. Like, give me, it's, is it overly uh, player it's, friendly to let, you know, to throw him out each, like it's almost impossible to imagine Parrot, Connolly, Ida clicking perfectly the first time. And I get building for the future, but someone like Cullen, he's never getting the same so picture. It's, it's, not, it's nothing about building for the future in terms of, the actual team for selection for the last camp. Mm. There's a few different aspects to it. But do you get the point, though? Yeah, like, oh, I absolutely get the point, and I agree is, with you in terms it, of it, if you have that rapport with someone and you know how they're going to play, you yeah. know their traits, you know he's going to take it on that side and then I'll make the run accordingly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I wouldn't feel if it's a, a criticism, maybe. It's a question. It's mm. a question. Because, there's, look, there's different reasons for the changes, but I wouldn't feel this Irish team have been given enough opportunities to go out again the next day and do it together. Yeah, I think there's a few aspects to that. Mm. Um triple header windows are something that we've never had to deal with as a nation three games in the space of seven days with the intensity that we're playing at is very very difficult yeah. so you've got to factor in and, we, and again that's something we're very conscious of this morning before I, before I left email players minutes who played what this week we're very conscious of players coming in that are undercooked that haven't kicked the ball for the clubs so can we bring someone in Jeff had hardly played a game for Newcastle before before that camp. Mm. Similarly with Jason Malumbi, 
other end of the spectrum is Josh Cullen he played a lot of football for Anderlecht a lot plays 90 minutes every single week two three times a week for, for Anderlecht and playing very very well mm. some players are not capable of playing 390 minutes okay. in the space of seven days that, that's where they're at in terms of their physical capability coming into camp so that's a constant juggling act is, all, is that why for instance say the likes of um, McGrath who does well against Portugal doesn't play against Azerbaijan when you think he might have actually worked well in that game maybe in behind I think one sometimes of the three. sometimes it's, it's, it's that in terms of what it's taken out of them sometimes we're learning as well in terms of going back to last year when we've played a player in, in the first game and then they've played and played really well and played 80-90 minutes for, in, for instance can, can they go again yeah we think they can they recover well but they haven't right so then we're going off our experiences of a certain player as well and there's, there's also the element of what we feel is going to hurt the opposition in terms of the profile of that particular player in that, in that position. So they're the kind of, the, they're the balls that you're juggling in terms of players coming in, mm. undercooked, overcooked, where they're at in terms of their physical capabilities. Is it realistic that this player can play the full three games? And the further you go up the pitch, we're big on our GPS and we work really close with Statsport who are phenomenal to work with the higher intensity running is the one that gets you so you look at Seamus in terms of played the first game in terms of as a wing back probably slightly different for him in terms of what he's even playing for Everton mm. playing in a back four picking and choosing when he goes a big part of how he played against Portugal was obviously Matt Doherty and Seamus Coleman breaking into that space so his physical loads were big played in a different position in, in the game against Azerbaijan tucked one in obviously right sided centre back and unfortunately he, he tweaked his, his hamstring right on so these are these are constantly things we're thinking of in terms of who can do what what is realistic for, for them to achieve and obviously you've got to bring the players care into it you can't just turf them out there you, you've got someone like Shane Duffy or John Egan like they're just there's a less explosive nature to how they play with the nature of the position obviously sure. compared to a wing back or one of our explosive wingers, for instance, or forwards. Mm. It's a fair enough answer. Like, it's a pity. Because I know, yeah. I, I'm sure you would like a bit more consistency. Well, if you go back to the traditional double headers, then it's manageable. Yeah. You go back to it. This, this window's a little bit different. You have two. Barring the travel, yeah. which is a, a serious jaunt over to Azerbaijan, two games, a week build-up. It, it, it's a bit of a luxury compared to what we've had, obviously. We mentioned Bizunu. Who are the other positives for you? over the last 15 months who's come through and impressed you I, don't, I, don't, I think it's it's both for me I think it's it, it's not right to just talk about younger players I think you've got to look at middle of the road players as in age not those, standard those, no no, <laughs> not standard important to point that out some of the younger ones have been amazing such as well, Darrell O'Shea for instance the way he's grasped his opportunity his mentality of how he's come through and the managers he's had at say West Brom that yeah like him, like him yeah, yeah might not have known him Slavin Bilic but pff, like him mm. Sam Allardyce now another manager so he's a, he's a big miss for, for both club and country he touched on the goalkeepers in that area the amount we've brought through and again I think that's what you get in terms of performances sometimes they're there sometimes there's, the, there's that drop off which is natural with younger players I think when you look we look at two in particular Andrew who's obviously just come into it brought him in in the summer to, to the training camp we had in Spain and played Andorra and Hungary obviously mm. that kind of and Jamie McGrath came into that Chio, Chio as well like Benny who's brilliant character personality and, and has real attributes that we, we like and he's playing very well for Rotherham if you look at that camp in terms of bringing them into the environment that was a little bit less hectic settling in getting to know the players that was a huge benefit mm -hmm. Andrew and Adam are developing really on international watch you know, that, that's the harsh reality of it yeah. Adam isn't getting as many minutes as he would like certainly as we would like at, at Norwich and, and that's obviously something that we're dependent on we want him playing we're eager for him to play Andrew played last week Stephen was at the game against Liverpool played very very well but the way that they're developing if they continue to do that alongside the club form where will they be in 6, 12, 18 months with the opportunity to the manager given them because you touch on it bringing him on after half an hour in Portugal Andrew like brave, brave move. I don't know if many managers would have would have done that. I think traditionally we would have erred on the side of caution, mm. but we have that much faith. So there's the younger ones 
but you can't forget about the journey someone like Shane Duffy's been on no. and the character he's shown and the desire to play for us and, and constantly be there and be unbelievable around the place Matt Doherty in the last camp I thought was outstanding so again a little bit of a tough time at the moment with his club but that platform and that I think the other thing is probably is important for us I think as staff we try and create a bit of a support network player welfare is really important to us in terms of looking after the players not just in camp but out of camp so the ones that are going through that tough time if you're playing week in week out nobody needs to hear from us if you're scoring goals you don't, it's the ones that are having that tricky time the ones that are out of contract like Robbie Brady at the moment that might need a little bit so that that's always been something that I've thought was needed mm. and it's certainly something that myself and Stephen are big on one last football one goals going to be the issue aren't they so you go back you look at all the results it just jumps out a million miles in the that period that you mentioned which doesn't sound fun around October, November including the Slovakia performance there are six games in a row with no goals and then there's the Serbia game which breaks the deadlock a bit the brown header probably the best goal, mm, of, the team goal. of the tenure brilliant team goal and a real moment of wow this is maybe the possibility there's the James Collins goal that night as well where the keeper is charged down but again you go no goals against Luxembourg one against Qatar it's a set piece move Andorra is its own weird game and I penny for your thoughts at 1-0 down there but then Hungary no goals in fairness Portugal there's a goal but it's a John Egan header Azerbaijan it's Shane Duffy Serbia it's an own goal so we bemoaned international managers after Robbie Keane saying well look I don't have a Robbie Keane what do you want me to do there is a certain truth in it what can you and Stephen do to try and get more goals yeah, you'll, you'll never hear that out of this manager certainly me there's we love working with this group of players they buy into absolutely everything we throw at them everything so you will never ever hear that and that's something that I've been critical of of things I've heard in the past even when I was involved as a player but you won't hear that from this manager's lip there's utmost confidence in what this group can achieve and I think when you when you tie in certain experienced players which I've alluded to in terms of what, what they bring and the younger players trying to develop to a level goals are not easily to c- come by at international level that, that's fact that's where we have to be brilliant at basics mm. every restart you touch on the, the pressing of goal kicks out of possession can we win it back higher up the pitch so there's less defenders to, to go and be where they're slightly spread or is it a set piece we work really really well on our set pieces and we've got players that are obviously dangerous from those you just have to find ways Joe yeah. that, that's where it's at it's not easy to come by them the FAI is or certainly was a dysfunctional organisation and that leaves a legacy behind now where I thought maybe we saw that mushroom up was around the Wembley video and there's a five day investigation into that video it proves costly because you lose Damien Duff you lose Alan Kelly mm. What went on there? Are there people or a person behind the scenes acting against the best interests of you, Stephen, and the team, in your opinion? I don't know. I still don't know. Um, which irks me a lot in terms of not knowing exactly what happened. Um, we'll go to the video. I think it was blown out of all proportion. I really do. I'm very comfortable what was shown to the players that night. Um in terms of how it was conducted in the aftermath, was I totally enamoured? Probably not. I look at my relationship and working relationship with, with Duffer and I was really, really sad to see Duffer go, like devastated. It was a horrible time in the aftermath. It was already a tough few months, which I've spoke to you about, but in terms of that time and the aftermath of that, dealing with that and and speaking with him and the relationship I've had with him for such a long time and very close with him I was devastated he left mm. like really really devastated and so why does he go and can you not talk him around look Damon's it's Damon's prerogative it's not for me to get into Damon's business here or anywhere really and I've got much respect for my I certainly wouldn't but from my perspective I was disappointed that he left we've been lucky and it's one one of, one of Stephen's best attributes in my opinion he recruits unbelievable staff mm. he really does I'm not talking about me if you me do here, say so way. yourself no I'm not talking about <laughs> me I'm talking about the backroom team the masseurs people not just professionals mm. Anthony Barry's come in from Chelsea who's been brilliant to work with slightly different to Damien 
love working with him love his views on the game at rapport around similarly with Dean Kiley mm. I think he's been outstanding with the young goalkeepers and again for me personally love working with him so it was in a nice chapter there's no way of getting away from that it, it hurt it wasn't nice it, it, the, the spotlight that, that came on was something you just had to get through and it was a horrible period it, it was it was one way of thinking this this is just unsavory it's un, it's it's not what's needed clearly with the with the journey that we were on and, and i do accept it's overblown but is it right that alan kelly didn't think much of the video like there must have, there must I don't, have been some people I don't who, know did, who didn't think much of it i i don't know okay. i can't say i've spoke to lots and lots of players staff members in depth about exactly what went on but the feeling i certainly got in general was there was there was no issue that was it was blown out of all proportion so you don't know for instance why an FAI investigation happened you don't know who makes the complaint or why all that kicks no. off which is which is do you like, have a suspicion of who it is yeah and do you confront that person no if it's it's probably not the right thing to do it's I think you know me well enough that I'm I'm quite confrontational <laughs> If, of, if it of front, of front things. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's an honesty about how I like to go about my life full stop. Mm-hmm. And if I've got a problem with you, I, I would say it to you. And, and like, I don't want a, an argument, I will just say it to you. And, and I would expect that in return. That's the type of relationships I like in my, in my life. Mm-hmm. But in this particular instance, I don't know, which is probably makes it worse okay. and, and harder. Do, do you feel it's, it's rude to go in and ask someone and accuse someone? Yeah, of course it yeah. is. Of course it is, yeah, unless you know conclusively that it is it is that person. And have you and Stephen and the team been able to make changes since all of that went on to try and protect the group a bit more? Or are you stuck with the fact that, like, there's people on the payroll and the FAI is not, you know, it's not a well, new organisation? There's obviously been... Stephen changed a lot initially in terms of the staff, when you think about it. And, and like I said, they've been brilliant people, whether it's on the sports science side, what we do on there... GPS with Stat Sport, the Masseurs, yeah. coaching staff. Like it's unfortunately Rory Higgins left to go to to become the manager of Derry City. Stephen Rice has come in and again took up that mantle and been brilliant mm. with it as well. Like so, there's, there's constantly been really good people that he's had to change, which he didn't want to have to yeah, change. But people leaving. No, I get that, I, and I get his team, but more so the wider FAI team. The, the wider FAI team is is nothing really to do with me in terms of what goes on we've we've been supported a lot in terms of what we've wanted to do how we go about things we know there's financial limitations in terms of where we find ourselves as an organization i think the powers that be look at what we're doing look at what we're trying to achieve they know the confidence we have in what we're doing and how we're going about it and where it will bring us to so overall the support that we've been given has been really really good obviously with the the video it was just one of those instances where could have obviously mm. been dealt with a little bit yeah and again sorry this is the last one because i don't even think the video thing is that big a deal my reaction to it was like not so much is this offensive or not just would that get me going you know seeing historical references to england i don't really associate them with raheem sterling like would that have got you going as a player um again i think you've just referenced that like as if it was the the only part of of the video it's it, far from it yeah you know so See, the, I, I haven't seen it exactly so there's there was no part of that video that would have offended me certainly right. in terms of what players need now i think it's very different to what players needed even when i was playing which isn't 20 30 years ago yeah look ultimately i think it's overblown probably spent too much time on it a sense of the loyalty that clearly is there within the group is that somehow we didn't hear about Stephen Kenny and his heart and what happened in Sweden, which is just extraordinary that something like that stayed quiet. And he did his interview here with Nathan and it was mm. a brilliant interview if people didn't hear it. So you would have witnessed that. That's no small thing to witness. What's your memory of the moments? Yeah, quite quite scary, really. Quite scary. Stephen's obviously spoke about it. Again, it's... Were you beside him? Yeah. Yeah, so Stephen wasn't feeling well on the bus and obviously he spoke about it and happened very near me. Fortunately, we had our doctor nearest, our sports scientist, Damien Doyle, medically trained, was brilliant in terms of how he, how he reacted. In terms of my medical knowledge isn't, isn't of that type mm. of level, so what can you do? What, what are you trying... You're just trying to 
keep people away and obviously try and help in terms of ambulance and medics in the actual airport itself. So it was a very scary situation to be in, yeah. And there was a, a few of us obviously stayed on board. You've got players that had already gone through and then you like you're weighing up who needs to go with players. I'd I'd said straight away I was staying and then invariably we ended up myself, Jim Crawford, who was the twenty ones coach with me as well at the time, who was now the twenty ones manager, Damien Doyle, the sports scientist, and then Fergus McNally, who was Stephen's friend from school, who's kit man. The four of us stayed, went to the hospital and, and yeah, he he was it was a scary, scary episode and it it hit me, like really hit me wasn't wasn't a nice thing to see um quite soft really joe i don't i don't like um I'm quite an emotional character beyond this kind of front yeah so uh no it was it was a scary scary chapter that i don't really want to have to to Relate see again, again. Yeah. so he's how long before you knew he was safe from the very worst yeah probably a few hours really yeah, few hours. Which, oh. the staff over there were outstanding absolutely outstanding in terms of it was four of us obviously it was pre-COVID so it wasn't as mm. you know in terms of being at the hospital trying to let us know we went in to see him obviously and stayed there that night and then we came back a couple of days later so it was yeah it was it, it was it. and then obviously liaison with with Stephen's Stephen's wife and who makes that phone call I did wow so it was not a nice one to, to have to make obviously. horrific yeah so it's Look, he's he's obviously a fighter. He's got a lot a lot about him, and um, yeah, thankfully he was he was in the the right place for it for it to happen, and, and the right medical care was was on hand. Did it hit you a few days after the enormity of it? I presume you go into some kind of automatic pilot. Yeah, you shock. do. I think adrenaline kicks in only in situations or any type of like. Not that I've been in that type of situation, but you have it kicks in, doesn't it? The adrenaline, you have to try and sort. But then when that wears off. That, I suppose it's shock and what you've seen and it, it's obviously he spoke to Nathan off the back of Christian Erickson's yeah. episode in um in the Euros, didn't he? So that was kinda yeah, it was Trig triggered it almost, yeah. Brought it back obviously certainly for him and, and I think it made him think about maybe things we'd seen obviously during that. Did he episode. talk to you after the Ericsson thing and say, I've 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 seen this now from a, your vantage point actually? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. A little bit. And what did you say to him? I was trying to downplay it. Look, I don't really want to go back there. <laughs> if I'm being entirely honest, it was grand, Stephen. Yeah. It was fine. It was grand. We went and had a nice meal that night. Yeah, no, I didn't. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. So, look, thank you so much for coming in and taking all these questions because I tried to throw the, some of the critiques at you. And well, I think it's out. only right. I think like there's a you're never going to tell absolutely everything. That's not the way it works, obviously. But I think there needs to be a transparency around how we're trying to do things, the, the direction we're trying to go. And is there any other message you want to get across or say about what's going on at the moment? No, not not really. I'm I'm very, very confident, unbelievably confident in where we're going with this group in terms of, I keep going on about the buy-in from players and it's, it's not just younger players, that cohesion between the younger players, the, the middle of the road players as in the age group, the mid-20s, the Josh Cullens, the mm. Chios, the Jamie McGrath coming in and then the senior statesmen who have been phenomenal. And, and if it gets to a point, so November and then I think there's a couple of friendlies in March and potentially Nations League summer in June and I think the contract is up in July 22. So if it gets to the end of that road and all these young players have all these caps but the FAI turn around and say, results aren't good enough, lads, thanks, we'll leave it there. Mm. Will you have regrets about how the, the way you've it's approached It's a long this? way to go between now yeah. and then, obviously. Um, but in terms of the way you've approached this and putting in the young players, do you stand over oh, it? It's, absolutely stand over it you can't see it we don't live in a perfect world I'm not a perfect person Stephen isn't players aren't nothing's perfect but in terms of your decisions you have to stand by them of course you revisit those decisions in terms of every aspect of the game the preparation the aftermath and then and we and we ask some seriously harsh questions to each other and as a group we encourage that as a staff in terms of did we get it right where are we where are we looking in terms of are we looking in the right areas are we doing things wrong so there has to be that analysis after camps in terms of players personnel style everything but equally very confident in where we're going with this team and i think the the bond is very clear to see with the players in terms of what they're trying to do consistently and I think now we just need to bring that together a little bit more and, and, and kick on from here it has to be the platform because the performances some of the performances 
have been very, very good. Very good. Keith Andrews, sincerely, best of luck. Cheers, Thanks so much.